Hello, um, my name is April Rovero, founder and executive director of the National Coalition Against Prescription Drug Abuse. I want to welcome you to this edition of our lived experience interview series. And the series aims to educate and also inspire viewers to take action to prevent substance use disorder and overdose deaths and other impacts from prescription drugs. Uh, so first, um, I want to thank and welcome Don Marie, who's personal story uh, today focuses on the important topic of prescription stimulant use. Uh, she's going to be sharing her personal story with us and uh, some critical advice on, you know, how we can be careful and um, remain you know, free from the dangerous, uh, potential dangerous impacts of these drugs. Um, I also want to introduce our two, two youth ambassadors today who are going to be conducting the interview, and that includes Manu and Karthik, and um, I want to have uh, you guys also continue watching for just a minute after the interview so that you can um, take advantage of the, the great resources that we have to share um, at the end of this. So with that introduction, I want to turn the interview over to Manu. Thank you, April, and thank you, Domri, for allowing us to interview today and helping us spread awareness. So with that being said, let's get started. Uh, so please share what you feel comfortable with about how prescribed stimulants have affected your life. Sure. Um, around uh, 1998, I received a confirmation of having attention deficit disorder from an ADD clinic in Scottsdale, Arizona. The clinic director said my brain imaging so mirrored that of a person having ADD, he asked if he could use my imaging scans on educational brochures to which I agreed and signed a release form. The ADD clinic was a terrific place to gain information about attention deficit disorder and learn behavior modification and cognitive training study techniques. Unknowingly, years earlier, I had already been compensating and using a lot of these skills of sitting in front of the class in my studies, tape recording lessons to review again later. Um, I graduated magna cum laude in 1992 with a bachelor's degree in elementary education. And although I received a diagnosis of having ADD, I never felt I needed to take a medication for treatment and tried managing my symptoms with the techniques I learned. Um, at this time, I was married and I had a beautiful son whom we named Nathaniel. He was a sweet and precious child with a lot of spunk. Unfortunately, Nathaniel's dad had a drinking problem and often became abusive physically and verbally. I tried on many occasions to save the marriage by asking him to attend therapy and marriage counseling. And I prayed a lot, but Nathaniel's father would always return to old behaviors. And I feared for Nathaniel, my safety. And sadly, I realized that divorce, although this went against everything I believed about the sacredness of marriage, having um, parents who are uh, happily married now over 50 years um, was the only possible option. Uh, when I received sole custody, I was fortunate to have my father and mother's loving support and Nathaniel and I live with them and worked part-time for our family. Um, I worked part-time with the family business and I was discerning next steps. Um, being comforted that Nathaniel was safe and dearly loved by my parents and his uncle Tony, who also worked for the family business, um, I decided that it would be a good time for me to complete my master's in counseling degree. Um, it was then I also discerned to be open to trying an ADD medication to assist me in focusing on my studies. In mid-January of 2000, a church friend who had ADD referred me to a doctor who treated patients with attention deficit disorder. Unfortunately, it was very easy to get a prescription for Adderall at this doctor's office. He told me nothing about the potentially life-threatening side effects, um, nor of the equally concerning potential effects of it being highly addictive. Um, There's very limited uh, information at that time as far as what was being told uh, to the general public. Um, I walked out of his office with a prescription for a stimulant in hand and soon after tried to get in for a follow-up appointment. And due to varying circumstances, I was never able to get back into seeing this doctor. I contacted the ADD clinic for a referral and they gave me one and I began seeing a new doctor. Um, I later came to learn that the original doctor was running a pill mill 
which um, uh, you know April's uh, aware of. This, this is a clinic that re regularly prescribes powerful medications such as painkillers and stimulants without sufficient medical history, medical monitoring, physical exams, or documentation. Um, and not everyone you meet in church is who they say they are. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, now under the care of a new doctor and receiving continuity of care through his office, in March 18th, my parents and friends noted I began acting strangely. Prior to this, I didn't notice any major uh, negative effects from the medication. In fact, I felt um, like I was getting a lot more done with laser-like focus. But uh, according to my family, coworkers, and friends, I began having more dramatic behavior changes, such as highly suspicious and paranoid behaviors and conversations talking incessantly about God, staying up all hours of the night, repetitively doing laundry and folding clothes and leaving to drive my car early morning hours in the evening. And I don't have um, memories of this. Uh, the psychosis had taken stronger hold. My father kept telling me to see a doctor. He could see something was dramatically wrong, but he could not put his finger on it. Um, a big problem here is that I never told anyone that I was taking medication for ADD, not thinking it was important because I was under the care of a good doctor. I couldn't have been farther from the truth. My poor father and mother were grasping at straws, watching their daughter slowly slip in and out of reality, not having any answers as to what was going on or what could be the cause. Um, on the evening of March 17th, Nathaniel, a mild-tempered and easy-natured child, was agitated and couldn't sleep that night. And so my father took the car seat out of my car to drive Nathaniel around the neighborhood and play his favorite music, which helped him to to settle down and finally fall asleep. Most likely, of course, he, he was agitated, sensing something's wrong, you know, with his mom, because he normally was so easy and docile in going to sleep. Uh, and Don Marie, uh, sorry to interrupt. Do you mind if I share a picture of Nathaniel with? Uh, no, no, not at all. Okay, yeah, he's such a beautiful boy. So here we go. Yeah, there's our sweet Nathaniel, beautiful little boy. So go ahead, I'll leave us that photo up here for just a few minutes. All right. Um, on that fateful morning of March 18th, 2000, I grabbed my sweet son out of his crib in an unchanged diaper, me in slippers and unchanged clothes, and ran him to the car with the distorted thought that something was trying to get him. Before my father and mother could stop me, I was out the door. They began calling family and friends to see if I had visited or where they thought I might be. Then at 10 a.m., my parents received a call from the police department that Nathaniel and I were in a terrible car accident. Witnesses of the accident reported that my car had been swerving back and forth over road lines before it crossed the median and hit straight head on uh, an SUV. Thank God. The people in the SUV were not seriously hurt, but Nathaniel and I had been air vacked to separate hospitals. Nathaniel died at 1 p.m. in the afternoon with my not being aware of his death until days later when the drug-induced psychotic fog lifted and I was told the brutally shocking news by my father that my son was dead. After, um, yeah. I'll continue, continue, sorry. The, uh, after having stopped taking Adderall, I immediately returned to normal, um, though forever devastated and heartbroken. Um, and I have not had a psychotic episode since nor have I ever had a psychotic episode prior to taking Adderall. Um, 
what gave me strength to cope with the tragedy was um, what got me through this horrifying or ordeal was and is my faith and action. I firmly believe in divine transcendence. I had strong faith in God before my accident. And through this unutterably painful ordeal, my faith is even stronger. I reached out to God instead of retreating inward. Not long after I was home from the hospital, I was introduced to a woman who oversaw a Bible study, which included several other moms who had also lost sons in various ways. The light of faith in their eyes and their will to carry on in loving memory and joy was inspirational to me and only strengthened my faith, my hope, and my resolve. Um, there are countless times God showed he was with me in the painful moments and that I was not alone. Um, in addition, uh, through a newspaper article given me um, by a family member, I became aware of another individual who had suffered a similar tragedy as myself with the same medication. I reached out and learned about his story, which you know, shattered, it broke my heart. Um, we, bo we both learned that the warnings on this medication at this time did not include psychosis, which we felt was a significant side effect. We became active in trying to raise awareness um, on the necessity of uh, there being additional warnings on the drug. And after a five and a half year fight with the maker, of this medication. There's now black box warning on it that includes possibility of psychosis in individuals who have never before experienced a psychotic reaction. And a black box warning is the most serious warning added to a drug's labeling information. Also included in the black box of Adderall is an increased risk of sudden death in patients with heart, underlying heart problems. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little bit different than, you know, insomnia, nausea, and loss of appetite. Um, so looking back, um, you know, what, what, you know, knowing now what I know, um, what might I do uh, differently? I would have made certain that my mother and that my father knew that I was taking and attention deficit disorder medication and to be on alert for any behavior or personality changes. <clears throat> I would also not have solely relied on medication to treat my ADD, but to incorporate the team and the strategies that I had learned from the ADD clinic. Um, and uh, if there's any advice that I would give to um, you know, people struggling with ADD or ADHD is, you know, a lot of the things I learned through the ADD clinic, which are wonderful. Um, they, they, they use biofeedback, there's targeted neurobiofeedback, there's organi organizational um, and time management strategies, which I found very helpful. Um, cognitive training, social skills training, there's even, um, you know, out there, there's family therapy, behavior modification. I even know of life coaches that have, uh, they assist uh, specifically with people that have attention deficit disorder, which I think is a wonderful, um, you know, in, ad in addition to those who sometimes need to take these medications. There are persons who, who have attention deficit disorder that there is, uh, there is a need to take them. I'm not anti-medication. I've never been anti-medication. Um, I was, you know, of course, concerned with the side effects, but, um, you know, uh, I, I definitely would say to incorporate, um, uh, you know, your family members, um, you know, and uh, to have a support team um, along with you. I don't think uh, an ADD, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a complicated diagnosis and it's something that you should have the loved ones involved with. It, along, of course, with those who, uh, who are trained to help with it right uh what do you think parents can do to make sure uh to be on alert for uh the medication that the youth are seeking for illegally or prescribed yeah that's a great question um i really believe that parents need to 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 uh, they need to manage their children's medication mm -hmm. you know these are we're talking about young kids um you know uh lock it up 
dole it out, you know, only as needed um, because stimulants are a, a, a powerful class of medications and that um, not only have the, you know, potential uh, serious side effects of, uh, you know, that we had experienced, even though, though rare, you know, um, it, it's uh, also a highly addictive medication. And so it's not something, you know, you want to be taking all the time unless, you know, it's, it's, it's really needed. And then, you know, even if it's taken as prescribed by persons who have been diagnosed with ADD and ADHD, um, they can be helpful, but they're, you know, they're sought after. Um, they're sought after on college campuses. These kids, you know, are going to be pressured. So the parents, you know, you need to lock it up. You need to lock these medications up and give these medications out only as directed, only as needed. And for students who are out there, um, think about it. Think about the responsibility you're holding in your hand with that one pill. And that there's a major responsibility that comes with it. You know, not only your education, but that if you give into that temptation to give or sell your medication, do you really want to be responsible for the death, for killing your friend, for, for harming someone seriously that you know, potentially has an underlying heart issue or, you know, you don't know how that person's body is going to react. So to really be cognitive about these medications. Yeah, thank you for that great advice. And thank you, Don Marie, for sharing your inspiring story. And also thank you, April and Karthik, for making this interview possible, allowing us to spread awareness. And for everyone listening in, please stay tuned in for another minute or so to learn about the helpful resources we have to offer. Thank you. Yeah, and I just want to add a couple more uh, thoughts here. Uh, Don Marie, I know how difficult the story is to share. And as another mom who's lost a son, to a prescription drug related um, incident. Um, my heart goes out to you and you know, you're my friend. <laughs> We've known each other now for a few years and I just, uh, I'm just, I admire your strength. I admire the fact that you've been willing to share and also educate. So thanks for this additional opportunity to get the word out about what could be a really potentially dangerous drug if not managed properly, if not diagnosed properly, if not, you know, dosed properly. So um, thank you, thank you, my friend. You're welcome. You're welcome, friend. And thank you for all the work you do at NCAPDA, a fantastic organization that I, I highly recommend people get more information about. Thank you very much. We'll talk soon. All right, sounds good. Yeah. Thank you. Here are a few resources we hope you'll check out. If you or a friend or family member has concerns related to substance misuse, suicide, or mental health issues of any kind, contact the anonymous 24-7 hotline at 800-662-HELP. Visit NIDA for Teens' website where fact-based information is provided that can empower you to make informed decisions about using and misusing drugs of all times. Watch the What is Naloxone video to learn more about opioids, how they affect the brain, and how an opioid overdose can be overturned with naloxone. Thank you for watching this interview. We hope you have found it helpful. If you have any questions or comments, please reach out to NCAPDA at either 925-480-7723 or info at ncapda.org. You can also join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to learn more. Thank you.